Hey. Yeah, family. You know how we dizzle. Nice little vibe with the brother. Hilltop, you know what I mean? Salute to the God. Salute to Cosmo and Cal for that excellent, excellent win last night, man. That was very impressive, man. I ain't gonna lie. You know what I mean? You got us looking good right now. The whole creative game looking good right now. You know what I mean? That was a good look, yo. Shout out to Malachi McAbee with an excellent live earlier breaking down the soul law. You know what I mean? The soul law and the vortex showing you that vortex permeates throughout the cosmos. That's the first cause of all creation. So in space, you have pockets of vortexian currents and another vortexian currents within the pockets of space. And these vortices are responsible for creating worlds. And that's the purpose of a vortex, to create a world. When I say world, I mean an inhabitable world where organic life such as living organisms as human beings can grow. Because the purpose of a planet is to birth humans, which in return will birth angels, with the return will birth gods who could transverse the cosmos. So a planet is an incubator, it's a seed producing humans for them to graduate and ascend into the cosmos, into time-space continuum, to lock in other vortices, investigate other worlds, as a product of creation from a vortex producing a planet. So the purpose of a planet is to produce mortals for them to become immortal beings. That's why in, in what book is it? Um, let me see the book of Synthetes. No, the book of, uh, when he said, I, 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 I I've sent Santhantis to people of the earth for immortal beings. That's the purpose. To birth immortal souls. Let me see if I can find that right here. Send my screen. Right here. Book of the Synopsis of 16 Cycles, chapter 1, verse 6. The Holy Council of Orion Chiefs, through the wisdom and voice of Jehovah, appointed one of their own, one of their number, Thetantes, an archangel, to take charge of the earth, to people it with what? Immortal beings during its traveling wane. So the purple of human beings is to become immortal and become like these, like these Orion chiefs to become like archangels, but you got to start on the earth plane, become immortal beings and then rise to these places. Now, Santantis was the first, the rank and title of Santantis, thus raised up by Jehovah, creator of worlds, became the first God of the earth and her heavens. Now, just with this one verse alone, you see structure. You see the rank and title of Santantes. What is the rank and title of Santantes? First God of the earth and her heavens. But what is Santantes? Santantes is an archangel. Where did he come from? The Holy Council of Orion chiefs, through the wisdom and voice of Jehovah, appointed one of their own. So where does Adantes come from? The Holy Council of Orion Chiefs. So Santantes is a big, he a big homie. He's a, he comes from the Holy Council of Orion Chiefs, being an archangel, which came during the Earth's traveling wand. See if I can get a map right here. Let's see what it say. The first 
arc cycle after the creation of man. This is the first arc cycle after the creation of man. When the earth is traveling and hit this line of light is when these angels is when they deliberated for it. So this, this verse coincide when the earth came through this first Ethereum light. And within this Ethereum light is when the archangels came. So when the earth hit that Ethereum light, just to come up on Right? The sun, second, the sun with this family, the solar system, travels in a large circle, which is divided into 1,500 arcs. The distance for one arc being 3,000 years or one cycle. So it's right here. 3,000 years or one cycle is the equivalent of these lines of light that you see that's numbered. So each line is 3,000 years. So one to here is 3,000, two to three, 3,000, which would be 6,000, and so forth. And you count the numbers and get the math. So the Ark of Juan is the name of the Ark that the Earth was traveling when it entered this Ethereum light. And when the Earth entered this Ethereum light, being the first Ark cycle, is when the, the Holy the Holy Council of Orion Chiefs, when they enter that arc cycle, through the wisdom and voice of Jehovah, appointed one of the number, Pentathes, the archangel, to take charge of the earth and to people it with immortal beings during, in what? The travel of one. In the travel of war, right? So now, now he's now Santanti is chosen to come down to the earth to take charge of it. And then it states the rank and title of Santanti, thus raised up by Jehovah, creator of worlds, became the first god of the earth and her heaven. So you have the first arc cycle and you're having. Now, a first God to rule, just like we got a first president, there's a first of everything. You got the first president, Narmer was the first king of Egypt, Sargon was the first of Mesopotamia, showing you that there's a first for everything. So, Waspi's letting you know that there was a time period that there was a first God to rule over the heavens and the earth. Right? The Synthantes had came with millions of angels who had been previously raised up from other worlds and he accomplished his work and was known as God. See that? He was known as El Elohim, El, God, Al, Sentantes, El, God, Sentantes. That's what he was known by. And it says, Sentantes was the, the first God of the earth and her heaven. And his place was within the Ark of Ron. His place was in the Ark of Ron, meaning that this is where he was stationed. You remember the Orion chiefs anoint, appointed one of the Roman Santantis to come down to the earth and people it with the mortal beings and to rule over it as God, as the first God. So Santantis was then the first God of the earth and her heavens, and his place was within the Ark of Ron. And during his cycle of 3,000 years, he raised up. Now, his cycle, Sentantes being the archangel, he was in charge of the whole cycle of 3,000 years. But in his absence, because the, the Ethereans only come down for a short period of time, then they ascend back up and they leave instructions to their successors until the next 3,000 years when the next archangel will come down and give more advanced instructions as mortals progress through the ages. So at this particular time, Sentantes was then the first God of the earth and her heavens, and his place was within the Ark of Juan. And during his cycle of what? 3,000 years, he raised up from the earth 1,500,000,000 brides and bridegroom. Now, what does that mean when it states he raised up? He raised up from the earth 1,500,000,000 
million brides and bridegrooms. What does that mean? Now let's go. Let's go to this precept. Let's go to the Book of Jehovah, chapter seven. Let's go to the harvest, right? Let's go ahead. Right here. This is a precept to this right here. So what does it mean when he says he raised up from the earth 1,500,000,000 brides and bridegrooms to Jehovah? What does that mean? Precept. Book of Jehovah, chapter 7, verse 16. At the termination of the dominion of my gods and his lords, they shall in these my bound heaven gather together all those angels who have been prepared in wisdom and strength for resurrection to my what? Etherean kingdoms. And these angels shall be called brides and bridegrooms to Jehovah, for they are mine and in his service. So what are brides and bridegrooms? Those who are ready for resurrection into the Etherean kingdoms. These shall be called my bride and bridegrooms to Jehovah. So when it states here, he raised up from the earth 1,500,000,000 million brides and bridegrooms that means he raised up from the earth one-time human beings who died and ascended in the grades and was at the point of graduation because they mastered all three of the realms of the earth plane the atmosphere the first the second and the third atmospheric plane and at the harvest time which is graduation that's the number one billion five hundred million brides and bridegrooms but that's within a time spirit of three thousand years so for three thousand years that's how many souls was birthed into the ethereal realm and like i said earlier the purpose of a planet is to bear is to bear people to create human life and this human life becomes immortal beings first they cross over terrestrially and then they progress through the atmospheric plane until the be, they, till they become brides and bridegrooms and graduate to the Ethereum heavens, move on to the realms outside of the earth and its atmosphere. That's the purpose of the planet producing humans. That's our purpose and destiny as graduated students of the planet. So again, it states, at the termination of the dominion of my God. So the termination, meaning again, when the earth goes to the second arc cycle, those ruling in the first, that's the termination mark. That's when the successors come in. That's like the president ruling in the first year, but in his fourth year, there's a succession. Somebody else is taking charge. So and that's, it's a termination for the first president. So this is a termination for the gods at the ending of their reign. And they rise into the Ethereum realm while other gods take the throne of Earth, rule for their 400 years, and then the same process takes place. So again, at the termination of the dominion of my God and his lords, they shall in these my bound heavens gather together all those angels who have been prepared in wisdom and strength for resurrection to my Ethereum kingdoms. And these angels shall be called brides and bridegrooms to Jehovah, for they are mine and in my service. And coming back to the precept, the Thantes was then the first God of the earth and her heavens. And this place was when the, the Ark of Juan, and during his cycle, of 3,000 years, he raised up from the earth 1,500,000,000 brides and bridegrooms. And when it states, like again, when it states he raised up from the earth, meaning people like us, all the humans on the planet now, and they we, we all cross over and begin to progress spiritually from the first, second, third resurrection, and then from the third resurrection at the harvest times, we graduate, whatever number that is, they keep count until the next 3000 until the next arc cycle until the next sub cycle until they get to 3000 or whatever the total number is bam that's to the harvest that's Satanthes or whatever archangel that's his host see that here's another example of a succession after Satanthes so it says after Satanthes came Ashan so now the first arc cycle was under the reign of Satantes. The second arc cycle is now under the reign of Ashan, as described right here. After Satantes came Ashan, sub chief in the realm of who we, in the Hyene arc of v Vetiva. And look what it states here. 
During the cycle of Enkaran, also 3,000 years, Ashang raised up from the earth a harvest of 7 billion, 200 million brides and bridegrooms. For, so for his reign of 3,000 years, that's how many souls he brought up. See, archangels or Ethereum angels, they're in rulership for 3,000 years, and they're responsible for how many souls that they can birth into the Ethereum realm under 3,000 years. So it's just like a school president. The president's duty is how, how much graduate students he could get to graduate as principal during his reign as principal. So these Ethereum angels, it's the same thing. Their duty is to see how many souls from the earth plane they could rise and get them to graduate into the higher heavens. That's the duty of the archangels. But the atmospheric angels, meaning God, ruler of heaven and earth, their duty is the same thing, but within a time period of sub-cycles of 400 years. Within a sub-cycle of 400 years, that's what they're there to do. And those 400 years are sub-cycles, seven and a half times. It's 200 years for the first 200 years. And then after that, it's sub-cycles, the sub-cycles of um, 400 years. Seven and a half times. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I could. Uh, I've got a picture of the off cycle. It should be up under here, if I'm not mistaken. So this is an arc cycle. The Ethereum angels are responsible for the whole arc cycle. While the God, who we know is God of heaven and earth, they're responsible for periods of 400 years. So every 400 years, there's a succession of a God the same way every 3,000 years, there's a succession of an Ethereum angel. So within the arc cycle of 3,000 years, God's rule seven times within a 400-year time period. So if the first God brings in a million Brights and bridegrooms, that'll be the number under his watch is God. This God brings in a million. Say all of them bring in a million. So the total number for Setantis would be 7 million angels under his arc cycle of 3,000 years. And the gods of heaven and earth are responsible for raising up brides and bridegrooms to the Ethereum realm. That's the purpose. That's the sole purpose of God. That's the sole purpose of the Ethereum angels. To raise mortals up from the earth plane through the atmospheric plane and then graduate into the Ethereum worlds. That's the purpose. And then these are the sub cycles. Book of Osiris, son of Jehovah, chapter 6, verse 20. So also I created for atmosphere a time of 400 years and a half time of 200 years. See, this shit got science. See that? So this is a time. Is, yeah. So even in your Bible, when it says a time and a timing and dividing of times, the OASP is giving you the numerical value of what a time is and what a half time is. A time is 400 years and a half time is 200 years. Broken down in the book of Osiris, chapter 6, verse 20. And even the arc cycle, synopsis of 16th cycle, chapter 1, 2, the distance for each arc being about 3,000 years. See that? And within the 3,000 years, you have the 400-year periods called time. Then you have the Adi. I mean, then you have a century Book of the Ark of Bond 14.4. For, for events of prophecy, there was also another candle, calendar called Adi, signifying sky time or heavenly time. What One Adi was equivalent to 11 long, 11 long years. I'm going to say got that one though. So the 11, 11, 23, 33, 66, 99, based off the 11s but I ain't got the picture of the 11 up. Yeah. 
And then we go into the deeper sciences up here. But yeah, just showing you that the Owaspi got things broken down, calculated with numerical arc cycles, which makes our job easier because we put everything in a time period. As you see here, we got everything in a time period. You got the creation of man, from the creation of man to the first era of civilization, 30,000 years. And then you got the time of the flood from the 17th arc cycle, 48,000 years, which is 24,000 years from our present time. We in the 25th arc cycle present time. And the time of the flood or the sinking of pond was in the 17th arc cycle. And then according to the Hebrew calendar, you know that the creation story started in 3761 BC. That's when the Hebrew creation calendar started. So like I said, they got to eat that if you believe it or not. That's what the standard, that's the standard for the creation. And then the flood would have took place in the 2100 BC. So that's off. That's totally off. So they're saying that, they're saying that the flood took place in second millennium BC. While for us, the flood took place in, um, do I got that calendar? No. For us, the flood took place in the 17th arc cycle. Their flood took place in the 23rd arc cycle, second millennium BC, this is in the 23rd arc cycle. The flood the Oaspi gives is 25,000, 24, 25,000 years prior to our present time, while the flood giving in the Bible, their time period will be less than 6,000 years. It's a big difference, big difference. And just a map, again, showing the creation story at 3761 BC, which would have been the Ubay period, the, 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 the Nakata period. And then in the OSB gives us the time period that the Battle of a Thousand Years transpired from 3753 BC to 2753 BC. And around this time, this is when Narma comes on the scene. In the OSB, you have Ajay and Darkness for 400 years, which is within the time period of the Battle of a Thousand Years. And at the ending of that battle, towards the end, you have Narma rising up, producing and starting the Old Kingdom. And you got the Middle Kingdom starting here. And then you got the then you got the um the old kingdom and the middle kingdom starting. So this whole this would be the whole middle kingdom right here. And from here to here would be like the old and pre-dynastic Egypt. This is supposed to be the time period that the flood took place over here. It's supposed to be the time period over here where creation started. So it's 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 a complete wrap. And here again you see the biblical creation account with real history placed into it. So again, right here. You see 3761, the creation of the Hebrew calendar. And when we move down to the time of the flood, according to the, the biblical narrative, it'll be 2106. And if you see, that'll be the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom is a time when Israel was in the, or the Hebrews was in Egypt for 400 years. That's the time of the Middle Kingdom. They have Abraham at 1684, which is off because Israel was in the, in here, this is, this is the sojourn of Israel for 400 years. In the whole Middle Kingdom. Look, 2106 to 1553, that's within a 400 year and a little bit over time period. Abraham would have been, Abraham would have had to been before the sojourn of Israel and the Canaan. He would have had to been back here somewhere. But look where they got Abraham, 1684 BC, that's off. And look where they got Moses at, according to the biblical timeline, 1254 BC, that's off. The time of Moses would have been right here, 1553 BC which would have been the ending of, which would begin, I mean, the beginning of the new kingdom with the rise of Amos, the expulsion of the Hikikai suit, the foreign rulers, that was the exodus and that took place in 1546 BC, which fits the time period that the Oaspi say the exodus took place. According to the biblical narrative, the exodus took place in the new kingdom. At this particular time, Israel was already in the wilderness. So when you put this shit on the timeline, you can expose... You could expose the false timeline. Yeah. 
So here you have, again, the new kingdom of Egypt, right here, right? This, they put, this is the time period they try to put Moses in. This is off. There is no exodus during the middle king, the, the new kingdom. There is no Pharaoh in the new kingdom who led a mass people out of there being ranked out by a Pharaoh. The only, only time we got that on record is with Amos the first. By the 10th century BC, Baal inspires Israel. He becomes the God of Israel. When Israel is in the wilderness, they're inspired by Baalim, the Baal, the, the whole Canaanite, the whole Leviticus priesthood is the Canaanite priesthood. See that? 1025 BC, 722, you get the Assyrian captivity, 586. You get the Judah captivity. They return back under Cyrus. They come with the, Torah, the Tanakh under Ezra in Babylon. Then they return with the Torah from Babylon. And then when the Ptolemies raise up the power, Ptolemy II commissions the uh, Hebrews to translate the Tanakh, which was inspired by Lua Monk, to translate it into Greek, which was done under Ptolemy II. And then the next time there was some um, influence on the Bible was with the, um, the writings of the New Testament, starting with the Gospel of Mark, since that's the first one found, and everything is piggybacked off of that. Nobody knows who wrote those texts. Then after that, you have Constantine, 300 years later, establishing Christianity, establishing the, the divinity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, putting a stamp saying, nigga, this is what it is. Now you have the Old and the New Testament somewhat established. A couple hundred years later, Luamung and Jabril fall out. Jabril inspires Muhammad. Now Allah is on the scene. And this is what we have today. The battle of these deities. All stemming from the 20, all stemming from the beginning of the 23rd arc cycle. You dig? Give me a one in the chat if you're feeling the vibes. Let's put the word and run. Let me get something here real quick, quick, quick. For pull back that rhythm. We have for pull the rhythm back still.
Bis auf Gott klar fallen. See the blood clad family and in the place. The priesthood of the Canaanites is a prototype of the Levitican priesthood. Heard that topic come up again, Osa. Not sorry to say, but that Kemetic priesthood is not influenced by the Israelites, but the Canaanites. I heard them talking about, well, you know, they, they shaved their head bald. That don't mean shit. First, you got to understand what is the purpose of having a priesthood. When you want to read the Leviticus priesthood, what is the purpose of a priesthood? Maybe let's get it in the scriptures itself. It ain't got nothing to do with <coughs> washing your hands. That's the practice of the ritual. But that ain't the focus. That ain't the purpose. See, when you deal with me, I get the purpose. Nigga, what's the point? When you get to the point and realize that this should be making no goddamn sense. The law of the burnt offerings. This is the law of the burnt offerings, right? Right? Let's, 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 let's start it. If he be, if he offering be a burnt offering of a herd, let it be a male without blemish. He shall offer it on his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle for the congregation. So we're talking about a burnt offering. So keep in mind, this is the priesthood. This is the Leviticus priesthood dealing with burnt offerings, right? And we're dealing with the time Israelites spent in sojourn in the wilderness. It was in the wilderness where they started the priesthood, as you see here. Look at the time period. That's what I said. When we put everything on the time period, that's the end all be all. So if the Exodus was 1546 and they spent 40 years in the wilderness, that'll be to 1506. But the catcher is almost 525. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O Israel? But ye have bore the tabernacle of your Malach. So there was worship in Malach bearing the tabernacle. Specifically, Amos said the tabernacle. That is something renowned and known in Israel, the tabernacle. You have congregations with the name tabernacle. The very encounter of the tabernacle was within the wilderness. But Amos is saying that your was, the tabernacle you was following was Malach. So if the tabernacle is followed by Moloch, that means Leviticus chapter 1 is giving you a detailed account of the burnt offering of Moloch. Why do I say that? Look what the very first verse says. And the Lord called unto Moses and spoke out of what? The tabernacle. See that? The tabernacle. What did it say here? But ye have borne the tabernacle of Moloch. This is the tabernacle 
that they're referring to. And again, if his offering be a burnt offering of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, and he shall offer it on his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation of before the Lord. Again, there were the word tabernacle. The same word Amos is using, but ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch. This is the only time you see the Israelites bearing a tabernacle. And it's describing what to do for the burnt offering. But the sole purpose of me coming here was to show you what is the purpose of the burnt offering. The purpose of the burnt offering is found in verse 9, right here. This is the purpose. This is the end all, be all. And I'm going to go to other verses to show you that it's the end. Now, this is the burnt offering. Look what it says. But his inwards and his legs and shall be washed in water. And the priest shall burn all the altar, burn all on the altar, to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet Savior unto the Lord. The sole purpose of you doing this for the Lord is for the Lord to what? Enjoy your sweet Savior. That's the sole purpose. That is the key word. That is the buzzword. That is the highlight. That is the sole purpose of everything going from verse 1 coming to 9. Everything expressed going on here from the killing of the bullock. Right here. From the killing of the bullock before the Lord. From that, from bringing the blood, from sprinkling the blood, the blood around the altar, that is by the door of the tabernacle, the same tabernacle that you see in Amos 5.26, but you have bore the tabernacle of Moloch. This is what you're doing for Moloch. You're killing bulls, taking the blood, sprinkling the blood, and he shall flay the burnt offering, right? Then he shall what? Cut into pieces. This is all the proceedings you got to do for a burnt offering for your Lord. The sons of Reverend, the priest shall what? Put fire upon the altar. So now they're putting fire on the altar. What they're putting fire on the altar for? They shall lay the parts, the head. What do you mean the head? The bullock head, the fat that's inside the body, the internal organs. You shall put that upon the altar. Right? And then verse 9. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. The priest shall burn. The priest shall what? Burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice. So you're taking goat heads, fat, blood. You're putting that all on the altar to burn it. And what is the purpose of you burning it? What is the benefit of the burning? An offering made by fire of a sweet Savior unto the Lord. That is the sole purpose of a burnt offering. So the Lord can enjoy the aroma and smell of the fat blood of a goat. This is your Lord. This is your most high. This is who you niggas pray to today in the church. This is who you Hebrew Israelites pray to in your synagogues and in your tabernacles. This is who you secretly pray to when you fall on your face. He wants flesh and blood. But what did Amos say? Ye have offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O Israel. But ye have bore the tabernacle of your Moloch and Herod demonstrating what Moloch do. Now keep in mind, this is the burnt offering. Let's go to another type of offering. Let's go to the next verse. Look what this say. The law of grain offering. Let's see what, let's see if there's any. Oh, wait, what do we have here? And what? And when any will of a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a flour, fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereof. And he shall bring it unto Aaron, sons, the priest, and he shall take therein his handful of flour whereof and of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a what? A sweet savior unto Lord. That's two. We got the burnt offering enjoying a sweet savior with dead animals. And we have another burnt offering with meat, flour, and then frankincense as a burnt offering. This is the benefit and the sole purpose. 
You don't get no benefit out of this. All you're doing is preparing the meal for the master. Just like a slave preparing the meal for his master, and you don't get the benefit of eating. The master get the benefit of smelling the sweet aroma from the cooked food that you made, and he over there chopping down. And when he get full and hungry, he may give you the scraps. So this is the law of grain offering. Let's see what other offerings they got that show and prove that it's a sweet savior unto the Lord. They got another one, actually. Right? Let's scoop down. I just seen another one. Right here. Verse 9. Verse 2, 9. Verse 1, 9 was saying the same thing. Now you got verse 2, 9. And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof and shall burn it upon the altar for it is an offering made by fire of what? A sweet savior unto the Lord. So I'm showing you that this Leviticus priesthood that you niggas trying to reenact now, trying to bring back, talking about you priest. I'm a priest of such and such. I'm a priest. I'm a Leviticus priest. I'm a whatever priest. The purpose of the priest is for you to prepare a meal for your Lord so he can enjoy the sweet savior. This is what the scriptures say. We ain't adding or taking away nothing. Again, as the Lord obligation of the first fruit, ye shall offer them unto the Lord, but ye shall not, they shall not be a burnt on the altar for a sweet savior. So he ain't burning the first fruit for a sweet savior. So I don't want that. He don't want no fruits for no, I, want, I need that meat and blood for the sweet savior. Y'all hold back on the fruit. Y'all keep that. <laughs> now look at this. The law of peace. Now if we're talking about peace, we shouldn't be talking about killing at all, right? But let's see if the Lord is enjoying a sweet savior in the law of peace. Uh-oh. What do we see here? Verse Leviticus 3, 5, and Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a what? Sweet Savior unto who? The Lord. A sweet Savior. How many? What are we up to like four? Four? The law of sacrifice, the law of burnt sacrifice, the law of grain, the law of peace. Hmm? As a matter of fact, what type of meat they offering up? Let's see. Let's see what type of meat we talking about. Because right here it says, and the two kidneys and the fat shall, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks and the cow above the liver with the kidney, it shall he take away. So they're cutting and gutting animals for Lord. That's what they're doing. This is your God. This is your Lord and Savior. This is your Jesus Christ, for those who believe that this is Jesus. And this is the Lord, for those who just believe the Lord. This is what he got you doing. Cutting up goats and animals so he can enjoy the smell. Now, keep in mind, he ain't eating it. He's eating the atmospheric parts thereof. Let's get that. Let's get that. Let me get another verse where he's enjoying the sweet Savior right here. Again. And the priest of Evan shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire of a sweet Savior. All the fat is the Lord's. All the fat is the Lord. Where does fat coming from? It's coming from a damn animal. And to prove it, let's go back up one. And he shall offer, and if his offer be a goat, he shall offer it before the Lord. So now we have a goat. Let me get a goat. You know me, I like to do this in real time. Let's get a goat. This is a goat. This is what niggas is offering. Right? Let's get a goat. See the goat? See the bathroom? See the goat? So now, let's go back to the verse. 
And if he offer and, and if his offering be a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. So he's going to take this goat before the Lord, which is before the tabernacle of the congregation, right? And he shall lay his hand upon the head of it and kill it before the tabernacle. And what? Kill it before the tabernacle. So they're going to take this goat and kill it. Now, sad to say, sad to say that that's what they did. They were the goat, the goat dead now. They done killed the goat before the tabernacle of the Lord now. Keep in mind, Amos 5, 26, but ye have bore the tabernacle of your Moloch. So that's what they're referring to, the tabernacle of Moloch. And this is what the tablet of Moloch got the Israelites doing or the priests of Israel doing and kill it before the Lord. Right? So they killed the goat before the Lord. They killed the goat before Jesus. They killed the goat before Yahweh. This is Elohim, the deity. This is what they got you doing. This is what you believe you have to do in the priesthood. <coughs> so he shall lay his hand upon the head of it. It done killed the goat before the tabernacle. And look, the sons of Aaron shall what? Sprinkle the blood there upon the altar. So now that the goat is dead, let's see if we can get that. Sprinkle. Watch this. Sprinkle goat blood. Let's see what comes up. So now these niggas are sprinkling goat, but okay, you know, they go to goat. These playing, they playing with the blood. They cutting up the goat, playing with the blood. They gotta get the blood. Playing with the blood. The African and the Jew playing with the blood, right? Sprinkle the blood before the altar. Sprinkling the blood before the altar, right? That's what we're doing. What are we doing? Sprinkling the blood. they cutting the blood. Those are your Jews. This is supposed to be a holy act, playing with blood, though. Sprinkling the blood before the altar. And he shall offer thereof his offering which is the goat, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the fat, let's put in goat fat. Let's see what comes up. Goat fat. This is goat fat right there. See that goat fat? That's goat fat. See that goat fat? So now you got the goat fat right here. This is what the Lord is telling you. What did the Lord say? And he shall offer thereof his offering, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat, the fat that covers the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards. So here is the fat right here, the outer and the inner fat. This is what the Lord is telling you to do now. This is your most high, right? Look what he's saying. And the two kidneys and the fat is upon them, which is the flanks and the cow above the liver with the kidneys. So now, that's goat fat. Let's see if we can get some goat kidneys going. Goat kidneys. This is what the Lord got you doing in Israel, in the, in the land of Canaan. So now, this is kidney. They have some goat kidney right there. See what it say? Goat kidney. So you got goat kidney. You got goat fat. And the two kidneys, these are the two kidneys, 
and the fat, they go to fat, that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the cow above the liver, with the kidney, it shall take away. We got to get a goat kidney now. I mean, a goat liver. Let's get goat liver. This is goat liver. There is goat liver right there. What does that say? Fresh halal goat liver. This is Muslim, good Muslim goat liver right here. See that? They all victim of the flesh and blood. So now you have goat liver, goat kidney, and you got goat fat, all required by the Lord. And look what the next verse say. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for a what? A sweet savior. All the fat is the Lord's. This is the fat. That's the Lord's portion. That's what the Lord. Now keep in mind, they're burning it on the altar. So let me get a burning grill. Let me get a burning grill. This is a, you know, let's get a grill smoking good. All right, there you go. That's the altar. The altar is the grill. You ain't even know that. When y'all niggas is cooking today, this is the altar. Let me put smoking grill. You don't even know that that goddamn grill is your altar today because that's where exactly where you put all your meat. See that? See the grill? See the meat? That's the altar. So now, let's run it back. You got goat fat, goat kidneys, goat liver on the altars being smoked. You see the smoke, the vapor coming off the meat. And then you have this verse right here. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. This is them being burned on the altar. All the meat. See the smoke coming up? See the smoke? It shall be the offering made by fire, a sweet savior. All the fat is the Lord's. But it's a sweet savior. What is a savior? Let's look that up. What does that say? What does that say? Taste and joy to the full. But here's the catcher. Right here. A character, taste, flavor of what? Smell. Smell. Your God is enjoying the smell which is the sweet aroma, the vapor coming off the dead flesh. That is the sole purpose of the Leviticus law. It's for you to prepare meals, chopped off goat heads, chopped off bullock heads, turtle doves, all type of weird animals, chop them up on the altar, burn them, and the Lord is going to enjoy the smell. That is the end game of the law. That's why I showed you continually the purposes a sweet savior unto the Lord. On this one, he even said the fat is the Lord's. Like, nigga, that portion is mine. Set apart that. So when we we, when we we grilling, right? We cooking, right? And I'm like, nah, nah, nah. Set, up, set apart this for me. That's mine. That's, that's the fat. That's the Lord's portion. That's what the Lord's going to eat. See that aroma coming off? That's for the Lord. This is for you niggas right here. You just sniff the aroma. So the Lord is sniffing and smelling the aroma of dead flesh. Let's go to Owaspi now. Let's go to Owaspi. Right? Let's go to Owaspi. Let's go to the book of Sethantis. Let's go to the book of Sethantis. With my Sethantis. Let's go to Sethantis. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 27. Let's go to 327. 
What does 327 say? Jehovah said, the fruit trees, the grain and seeds that grow in the atmosphere, have I created a ceaseless harvest going upward into the atmosphere, which is shall be the sustenance of the spirits newborn in heaven. Now here's the catcher. Now keep in mind, your Lord got you burning flesh for you to enjoy the aroma, the vapor coming off, spirits sucking the vapor for sustenance. That's what we're about to show next. Right here. What does the next portion of this verse say? Look at this. Look at this. But the but whosoever feast on flesh, feasting on flesh, because your God got you cutting up goat fat, he got you cutting up kidneys, and he got you cutting up liver. What did the Oaspi say? But whosoever feast on flesh on earth shall not find spiritual food in heaven, but he shall return to the butchers and eating houses where flesh is eating. Here's the catcher. Here's the catcher. Before it is rotten, he shall what? He shall feast on the atmospherian parts. See that? So if you eat flesh and blood, right here. But he shall return to the butchers and eatery houses where flesh is eaten. This is the spirit now. Before it is rotten. He shall feast on the atmospheric parts of dead animals. He shall what? Feast on the atmospheric parts of dead goat, of the, the of the kid of the goat's kidney. He shall feast on the atmospheric parts of fat, of goat fat, and he shall feast on the atmospheric parts of goat liver. And in return, the Lord is enjoying the sweet savior of dead animals. And here goes the vapor going up, which is sustenance for the spirits of the dead. If you're carnivores, you're going to be sustaining the sustenance of the vapors that um, e e emits off meat, right? Again, but he, get that, but who, so, but whoever feasts on flesh on earth, shall not find spiritual food in heaven, but he shall return to the butchers and eating houses where flesh is eating. And before it is rotten, he shall feast on its atmospheric parts. Place a guard, therefore, over the newborn, meaning the newborn spirits, lest they engraft themselves on mortals, feasting on their feast and so go down in destruction. So it's going to cause destruction if you continue to feast on this aroma, but which in return, your God is telling you to do for him. So the Oaspi is exposing that your Lord, your very Lord is practicing impurity, even, even dealing with the vapor, even dealing with the atmospheric food of sustenance. Because right here, Jehovah said, right? Jehovah said, from the trees, fruits, flowers, grains, and seeds that grow in the ground, I have created a ceaseless harvest going upward into the atmosphere, which shall be the sustenance of spirits newborn, of men newborn in heaven. See that? So Jehovah saying that the same way you looking at the vapors coming off these trees is the same way fruit trees hold on is the same way fruit trees emit the same form of odor. See that? You see all these fruit trees? You ever smelled the mango and how good the mango smelled before? You smell some of these fruits and smell how good they are? This is the sustenance for the spirits newborn in heaven. This is what Jehovah talked about. Jehovah said, Jehovah said, from the trees, fruits, flowers, from the trees, fruits, flowers, the luscious and beautiful smelling things, I have created a ceaseless harvest going upward into the atmosphere. 
So the same way you see the smoke going into the atmosphere is the same way there's a radiate, a radiation, an aroma radiating off these uh, fruits into the atmosphere. And the proof of that is the smell. You could smell the aroma of a mango, a banana, an orange. You could smell the fruit. That fruit that is emitting that is sustenance, food for the spirits, as shown here. Jehovah said, from the trees, fruits, flowers, grain, seeds, Roots that grow in the ground, I have created a ceaseless harvest going up and into the atmospheric world, which shall be the sustenance of the spirits of men newborn in heaven. See that? But whosoever feasts on flesh shall not find spiritual food in heaven. But whosoever feasts on, what does he mean when he say, but whosoever feasts on flesh shall not find spiritual food in heaven? Obviously, it is spiritual food in heaven because we just showed it right here. But if you're not sustaining on this spiritual food in heaven, you're not going to find it because you're not going to be adapted to this because on your physical life, you didn't eat fruits. You you ate, you ate was too busy eating goddamn goat kidneys. You was too busy eating goat liver. You was to eating baby back fat. So when you crossed over, you had to be in a spiritual environment that is conducive to your diet. So when the dead animals... It's being cooked in that vapor, that, that 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 aroma is going into the atmosphere. For you, carnivores, man, that is your diet. You're not going to find spiritual food in heaven. This is the spiritual food in heaven. Alkalinity, purity, increase your spiritual awareness. These fruits do that. But the meat brings you down, brings you inflammation, brings you death, brings to the body. The aroma and and and... and and if you ate like that alive and you died, this is going to be your sustenance in spirit, the sustenance of dead flesh, as stated here. But whosoever feasts on flesh on earth shall not find spiritual food because you're not going to be in the realm of the vegetated fruits and trees and banana trees and mango trees. You're not going to go there. You're going here. But he shall return to the butchers and eatery houses where flesh is eating, where flesh is eating, Right? You're preparing these meals. Flesh is eating. See how they're eating that? That goat liver. See that? Y'all love that. Right? Where flesh is eating, before it is rotten, he shall feast. Meaning sustain. Meaning sustain. Feast off its atmospheric parts. Place a guard thereof over the newborn spirits, lest they engraft themselves on mortals, feasting their feasts, and so go down to destruction bag drop. So the Leviticus law and the sole purpose of the Leviticus law is for you to offer a sweet savior unto the Lord of dead flesh, which is impurity. Hmm? You're not going to find spiritual food in heaven, but but dead, <laughs> you're going to be in a, in, in a place of dead vapor, dead odor, stinking in the fucking butcher houses. This is a butcher house we're dealing with. The tabernacle was a butcher house. All types of meat and animals getting cut for the for the and this is supposed to be the law of peace. And then the law of peace, you over here killing. So you got the law of grain, the law of peace, the law of sin. Oh, you know in the law of sin, they taking they taking more goats and animals. Let's see. See, again, right here. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle. Who got the tabernacle again? The tabernacle, Amos 526. But ye have bore the tabernacle of Moloch. So do you think the Most High Creator will have you doing all this? When the prophet Amos is telling you that, nah, the Creator ain't tell you to do this. But, but Moloch, which is Baal, and he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle and the congregation before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill it, the bullock, before the Lord. Your Lord got you killing animals before him. And keep in mind, this is the sin offering. So regardless of what offering, from the peace offering to the burnt offering to the grain offering to the sin offering, all of it is killing animals. But what is the purpose? What is the purpose? What is the purpose? 
Hmm? Skip that. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar. Now they playing with blood, putting on the horns. Horns. The devil play with horns. What are we playing with horns for? But nonetheless, this is what the, this is the Leviticus priesthood. This is what they was practicing with the tabernacle in the congregation. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of the sweet incense, right? Of the sweet incense before the Lord, which is a tabernacle of the congregation and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door. Of the you see what's going on? They playing with blood. You got to do all this for God to be pleased. You suck in the aroma of the air of dead flesh with your God. Because when you burn that, you smelling it too. You smelling the same shit your God's supposed to be smelling. And what is the purpose? Look what all they doing to the bullock. They killing. Look at this. School down. And the elder of the and the elder of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord. And the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. These niggas is killing bullocks. Didn't didn't Isaiah say to kill a bullock is like killing a killing an ox is like killing a man? Let's get that. Let's get that. When Isaiah say that. Get that. What verse that is? Isaiah 66, 3. Let's go to Isaiah 66, 3. Isaiah 66, 3. Where is that? What that say? He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. Look, what is an ox? We did this before. We'll do it again. An ox. Sure, in Hebrew. What is an ox? A goddamn bullock. Huh? Huh? What did Jaja -Ja say over here? Though? What did your false God say? And the elder of the congregation shall slay their, shall lay their hands, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. But wait a second. In Isaiah 66, 3, your ox is a bullock, and in return, the verse states, he that kills a bullock is as if he slew a man. So we have a contradiction now because Isaiah is saying that, man, if you kill a bullock, man, it's like you killing a man, you killing a brother. That's what he's saying. But then in Leviticus, it's telling you that the Lord wants you to kill the bullock before him. This is proof that there are different deities and different practices and behavior and influence by different gods in the Bible based off this alone. Hmm? And the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. Isaiah, let me take the strongs off. 66 3. He that kills an bullock is as if he slew a man. And the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. And the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. So which one is it? If this, if Isaiah was here, he would, he gonna be looking at y'all like, man, that's like killing a man, and the Lord gonna be like, nah, you wrong. Kill the bullock. 
murder the bullock, sprinkle the blood of the bullock, take the horns of the bullock and put blood on it. <laughs> your God is sick. This is what your God got you doing in the congregation of Malak, playing with these bull these bullocks. Hmm? So we found numerous verses of a sweet savior unto the Lord which is the sole purpose of these gods. So if you want to follow the Leviticus priesthood, understand this is what you're going to be doing. And he shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat is taken from off the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savior unto the Lord once again. And the priest shall make an atonement to him, for it shall be for giving him. So again, a sweet savior unto the Lord. Again, so we so we went from the burnt offering, the law of the burnt offering, you got a sweet savior. The law of grain, you got a sweet savior. The law of peace, you got a sweet savior burning to the Lord. The law of sin, the sin offerings is the same thing. A sweet savior. Mm -mm -mm. The law of sin, all these, the law of guilt. Is the Lord looking for sweet savior? Is the Lord guilt? He trying to get, he trying to get chicken back every time he can. Anytime these niggas break this this commandment, they gotta offer up some sweet savior, some sweet uh, bullock, some sweet fat, some baby back every time. That's crazy. Your Lord is wild. Can't nobody make this shit make sense. Don't listen to nobody trying to give you their personal explanation. If you notice, I'm reading Bible. I'm reading a wasp. I'm not reading nothing other than what the scriptures say and enforcing you to let you know that this is what it's saying. See, people want to put their private interpretation on shit. We ain't putting no private interpretation on nothing. So that goes to show the nature of the beast, the nature of this God coming back right here. Amos told you for 40 years in the wilderness, you was worshiping Moloch, carrying the tabernacle of Moloch. And it is the same time period that the Leviticus priesthood was established. This Leviticus priesthood was established from Canaanite influence, not no goddamn Egypt. Because if that's the case, you would have to show Egypt in papyrus doing what the Leviticus priesthood was doing, what I just showed. You would have to show that in Kemet. You can't show that in Kemet. See that? You can't show that in Kemet. Original model of Canaanite temple, 3,000-year-old Canaanite temple discovered in Buried City in Israel. This is a Canaanite temple. This is the Canaanite temple. This is the same tabernacle format. You know what I mean? Although the tabernacle was a portable tabernacle, which was a shadow of the temple, right? This is what it say. The temple of Lakesh is the first ancient Canaanite temple found in more than 50 years and is extraordinarily well preserved, say archaeologists. See that? It's a Canaanite temple they found. This is the temple, Magdal type temple at Pila, first built in 1650 BC. This is same time period Israel was in Egypt. This is 100 years before the Exodus. So the Israelites couldn't have been practicing the Leviticus priesthood in 1650 because they would have been inside Egypt. But at this time in Canaan, here is the archaeological proof that they had the temple with the priesthood already set up during this time. The discovery includes an idol of the Canaanite god Baal that was the object of what? Prayer and sacrifice. 
in the temple in the inner sanctuary. 1 Kings 6.19. The inner sanctuary with the temple was for housing the chest of the commandments of God. I wonder what God? Could it be the God Baal? With an inner sanctuary? Because Baal got the inner sanctuary first. Remember, it says 1650 right here. Israel is in Egypt. By the time we get to Kings, they already sojourning in the land of Canaan around this time of Kings with an inner center in a sanctuary. The time of Kings, 10th century BC, 11th century BC. This is 16th century BC. This is 500 years prior to this. So where you think they got the model from? They didn't get it from Canaan. I mean, from um, they didn't get it from the Egyptians. The reason they didn't get it from the Egyptians, because when they left Egypt, the tabernacle was established in the wilderness. See that? Going towards Canaan. So now, 650 BC, you have an inner sanctuary dealing with the Canaanite god Baal. So that inner sanctuary, that outer sanctuary, that inner sanctuary with the Holy of Holies, y'all niggas is worshiping Baal. This is what the archaeological records are showing. And the blueprint is what y'all niggas did. So here you have a Canaanite temple within the inner sanctuary 600 years before the Temple of Solomon was built. This is the archaeological evidence. And look what it says at the bottom in pink, in purple. Foundations of the Canaanite Megadal Temple, originally constructed around 1650 BC during the Middle Age of the two major rebuilds the first 1350 bc during the late bronze age and the second 900 bc so they placed this at 615 bc re-established 1350 bc so we're showing you that this is pre-israel hmm? see that this is the exodus the exodus is 1546 bc to 1506 BC. This is the time when the Leviticus priesthood was established. You remember, they said the Canaanite temple was 1650 BC. That's over 100 years before the Exodus that the Canaanites already had an established priesthood. See that? This is the evidence of the Canaanite priesthood. Not the Israelite priesthood, but the Canaanite. And look what it says here. The Canaanite temple was dedicated to the god Baal. We keep telling you niggas that the Israelites coming out of Egypt, for that for the time the Israelites came out of Egypt, it was in the wilderness. And for the time they established the kingdoms between the north and southern, all that you niggas was under Baal. From the Leviticus priesthood being established, Baal. Figurines of Baal. Here's a map. Ah, oh, I got the map up here. All right, let's look at it. See that? See that? When you put, like I said, when you put everything on the timeline, it's game cooked over. This is the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom of Egypt started from 2187, 2186 BC to 1556 BC. The Exodus of Moses was 1546 BC right here. 1546 B to 1506 is the 40 years in the wilderness. It was the 40 years in the wilderness that you worship Moloch. You bore the tabernacle of Moloch, which is referenced in Amos 5, 25, 26. But here, 1650 BC, 100 years before the Exodus, when you were still in Egypt, sojourning, the Canaanite temple was already up and running. It was already established. They was already doing what you see them doing here, offering up sacrifices to their God. That's what the Canaanites was doing in 1650 BC. The Israelites didn't start this practice until after 46, 1546 BC in the 40 years of the wilderness. And Malak is Baal. So you had Baal ruling already in Canaan when the Exodus took place and you niggas decide to run up in Canaan. Now you're practicing what the Canaanites practice because the proof is in the whole Leviticus chapter, what I just read, showing you the offerings. Just the whole history of Israel right here. So look at that. Look at what's, what, um, do I got Solomon Temples on here? Yeah, right there. Second temple rebuilt, 516 BC. So you got 516 BC, 
And then you got 1650 BC showing you how long the Canaanite temple had a priesthood prior to the tabernacle in the wilderness, prior to the first temple being established under Solomon, and then the destruction of the temple and the rebuilding of the second temple where they started a priesthood again. All that came long after the Canaanites. See that? So here you have the Canaanite temple of Baal in the land of Canaan, 1650 BC. That's over 100 years before Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness. That's 600 years before Solomon's temple was built. And keep in mind that 1650 BC, the Hebrews were still in Egypt. The Hebrews sojourned in Egypt for 400 years, and that was during the Middle Kingdom. And here's the Middle Kingdom right here. The whole Middle Kingdom lasted from 28, 2181 BC to 1556 BC, including the Intermediate Period. That's the whole kingdom. So when you niggas was enslaved in Egypt, being whipped by Pharaoh, Canaan was already established. Now here is a picture of the Canaanite temple. These numbers represent the location within the temple. The number one, that is the entrance where the priests would enter in from the east. And I want you to pay attention to the number four. The number four, foundation for the late Bronze Age threshold to the temple of Holy of Holies. See that? Number four is the Holy of Holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant, all that will be. So you would come in through here, and then you would make your way back here. The priests would make their way back here, the Holy of Holies, the Canaanite priests. Now, this is a real historical model of the Canaanite temple. You cannot find this duplication in Kemet. All you're going to find is drawings and pictures. When the part did her debate, every picture she showed of the tabernacle or, 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 or of a priesthood, it was a drawing. It wasn't nothing real. This is real. This is archaeological evidence of the Canaanite priesthood numbering, showing you where the wall stood, the western wall stood, the eastern wall stood, and the western wall stood, and the eastern wall was the entrance in, and the fourth was where the Holy of Holies stood. See that? See that? Easy work. This is an example. So by the time Israel started the migration into the land of Canaan 600 years later, the Canaanites were already established with the priesthood, a temple, with an inner sanctuary, and the Holy of Holies. And this is an example of the Canaanite priesthood with the Holy of Holies, which was copied by the Israelites, the Leviticans, and an artist's impression of how the Pelham and Goodall Migdal were temple would have looked during the Middle Bronze Age, 1600 BC. See that? This is their consummate example. Now, this is a drawing, a rendering off of what is actually really seen. The Temple of Solomon, according to Jewish tradition, the Temple of Solomon, also known as the first temple, was built by Solomon circa 990, 931 BCE, long ago on the spot where God created Adam. Right, that's bullshit. So 9, 9th century BC is when the Solomonic Temple was just, uh, created. Now this is the this is a, a, a model of the temple, but look what it say here. Specifically, it says Holy of Holies. I wonder where they get the concept of Holy of Holies. Right? They were the model right there. Where they get that from? Guess what? You got the Canaanite Temple. 650 BC, inside, beside it, Solomon Temple, 990 BC. And there you see where the Canaanites or the, the Israelites got the model from, the idea of a holy of holies. Because remember, this is turned backwards, but this is the east. This is where you come in at. So if they follow in the same rules, this would be the east where you enter in at. And towards the back, would be the Holy of Holies back here. So they got the same blueprint model. Now, what's the purpose of the temple? Leviticus 16, 1 through 4. Let's read the highlight. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place 
with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram offering and a ram for the burnt offering. Now we just described and read the purpose of a burnt offering is the purpose for God is to enjoy the smell. That's it. When you finish do that, you just walk back out and, you know, live your life until you sin again. And you got to bring God some more food to, to, to smell. You got to feed the gods. So the sole purpose of the temple is to sacrifice to God a burnt offering of animal for the sin of Israel. Leviticus 2 or 2 to 8. When I read that earlier, just talking about the burnt offerings that is offered up to the Israelites, the goat heads. See that? You see the goat heads? You see the goat, the legs, and the fat and all that? This is what your God is commanding you to do. If you believe in this Bible, if you're trying to follow the Bible, if you're trying to follow the Old Testament, you have Old Testament Hebrews, this is what they got to do. They got to cut off the goat heads for their God. That's a sweet Savior right here. Again, of a sweet Savior unto God. What a Savior? Taste, good food or drink, enjoy. And right here, smell. Hmm? A characteristic taste, flavor, or smell, especially a pleasant one. See that? This is pleasant. This is pleasant to God right here. The smell of goat heads is pleasant. Hmm? These are the priests of Arian carrying the goat heads on the altar. This is what's going on with the house of Israel. Look at that. Sacrifice donkey and ancient goth reveal a Canaanite trade secret. A little reference to a sacrifice Canaanite donkey. You know what I mean, family? Give me a one in the chat if y'all getting this understanding. Throw some vortices. Where them vortex at? On the late night mission vibes, you dig? Run that box on. Run that. That's the rhythm. Oh, yeah, you know what? What's your first wrong button? Make sure to get your bidders, of course. Make sure to get your bidders still, you know. Bitter Sweet Herbals, where the taste is bitter, but the results are sweet. BitterSweetHerbals.com Run the rhythm! Bitter Sweet Herbals, where the taste is bitter, but the results are sweet. BitterSweetHerbals.com Yes, family, I make sure you get your bitters, you're done, no the order, you know? Job assistance. Yeah, we having a nice vibe, you know what I mean? Be exposing, we're gonna stay exposing the false gods, stay on top of their necks. Showing you that the whole thing with the tabernacle, you're offering burnt sacrifices to the tabernacle. And keep in mind that in Revelation now, with the John same Revelation, The 
Mr. Johnson, now you got you gotta remember, we just we just broke down what goes on in the tabernacle. We broke down the law of birth offering. What is what, what requires of it? The killing of animals and offering up the animals as a sweet savior. We went through the law of grain, which is goddamn grain ain't got nothing to do with animals, and you still chop them up, go heads, for the law of grain. Then we went to the law of peace. We still see we had to offer up blood. We had to offer up bullocks and oxes for the God. Then we went into the sin offering. And nonetheless, we had to offer up a bullock again. So what I'm showing you, regardless of what the law is, regardless of what the sacrifice is, is the same proceedings. To offer up a dead animal, for you to kill it, sprinkle the blood, put it on an altar, burn the inward parts, the fat and the head for a sweet savior, a sweet aroma to your God. That's what it's saying. That's what you're following. Now in Revelations, which is the end game, because we asked, what are we going to do in the kingdom? What if the kingdom is coming down? Let's read it. I mean, that is some assumption. Share screen. Right? This is Revelation. I saw Revelation 21 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away and there were no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the holy city. The Strong's Concordant, that word city. Polis. What does that mean? It's a feminine noun. What does that mean? A city, one's native city, the city in which ones live, the heavenly Jerusalem, the abide of the blessed in heaven, of the visible capital in the heavenly kingdom. Look at that. Look what it say. In the visible, meaning you can see it's tangible, physical, capital. In the heavenly kingdom to come down on earth after the renew renovation of the world by fire. Look at that. So the new Jerusalem, the new city, is going to be a physical kingdom coming down out of heaven. As said here, it's visible. The visible is physical. Visible is 700 to 300 nanometers. That's visible. Let's get that. See, we deal with science. Electromagnetic spectrum. There go your science right there. Right? Well, look what it say. Look what this word say. What'd that say? Hmm? You think this play play? What'd that say? Visible. Right? What that say? Of the visible capital in the heavenly kingdom to come down to earth. Let's stop there. Of the visible kingdom, hold on. Of the visible capital in the heavenly kingdom to come down to earth. This is visible. This is a science. Visibility ranges from 400 to 700 nanometers. This one doesn't have the nanometers on it. Let me see if I can find one with the nanometers. If you know how to read visible light, it's 400 to 700 nanometers. But nonetheless, it says visible. So, visibility is 700 to nano, 700 the 300 nanometers, invisibility will be 800 moving forward and outside of nanometer 300, 200 on down would be outside of visible light. So nonetheless, visible light, we deal with a science.
So we're dealing with something that's going to be physically coming down out the sky. It's a kingdom. It's a kingdom. Now keep in mind, we showing the etymology of these words. Kingdom. Oh, that's not, that's just an appreciation of my big. All right, so we got that. We got that. We're talking about a city, a real city, New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride for his bridegroom. So we established that this new city is visible. Because John said he saw it. And here's the catcher. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. The tabernacle of God is with men. The first time you had the tabernacle of God with men was with the Leviticus priesthood. Coming back to the law of sacrifice. Coming back to Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1. This is the law of the priesthood right here. So what did Revelations 23, 21-3 say? And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. The first time the tabernacle of God was with men was with Moshe and the Leviticus priesthood. That's when the tabernacle was with men. Now again, the tabernacle is going to be with men. Right? So there you have it. If the tabernacle is going to be renewed, what is going to go on in the tabernacle? Because the first tabernacle, there was offering goats and animals in the kingdom. Is there a possibility that God can be offering goats in the kingdom when the new Jerusalem and the new heaven come? Where is he going to get animals to, for the sacrifice? Where is he going to get that at? Hmm. You know where he's going to get that at? You know what? God is going to get animals for the new kingdom for when they start sending in the new kingdom because you know they're going to send in the new kingdom. You know niggas going to fuck it up. So when they mess it up, you know what they're going to use? You know what they're going to use for sacrifice? Bless are they that do his commandments that he may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates in the into the city, meaning New Jerusalem. For without our dogs, dogs are going to be your animals for your breaking the law, the tabernacle, because it ain't saying no other animals. It just said dogs and sorcerers and male prostitutes, murderers and adulterers, whosoever loveth maketh a lie. But animals is what's used to do sacrifice. He ain't safe for without our sheep. Why, you know, why, why not the pleasant animals? For without the kingdom are giraffes, you know, hummingbirds, you know what I'm saying? Like nice animals. But he got dogs outside the kingdoms. You know what I mean? You got German shepherds, wolves, pit bulls. And you're going to have to use those for your new sacrifices in the tabernacle. But the craziest thing when me and Cosmo was on the last time, when we did the strong, when we did the strongest recordings on the word, um, whoremonger. Look at this, yo. It's over for these niggas ever in life. If them niggas debate and we have a debate and I bring up these niggas end game on, on the kingdom of New Jerusalem, when you got whoremongers, look what whoremongers say, yo. Look what that shit say, family. If Sarnetta find this out, oh my God, it's over for you niggas. A whoremonger is a male prostitute. His body is to another's lust for hire, nigga. That shit could be male or female. It ain't even say it's that nigga. You just for sale. Whoever can buy you. Huh? Look, a male prostitute. A man who indulged indulge in unlawful sexual intercourse fornicator that's crazy it said it again a male why not a female prostitute huh you know honestly how many of you like 
You know, you, you, when do you walk the street and see male prostitutes? You, 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 there's female prostitutes out in these streets. When you look at the pimps and the Don Juans, it's female prostitutes. You ain't never heard these niggas talking about male prostitutes. Now you hear about it through the Puff Diddy shit and certain underworld activities, but on a normal basis, you know prostitutes for being a woman. Go to any stroll in any neighborhood, you don't see chicks prostituting. You ain't gonna see no nigga out there prostituting. So that's crazy. You got male prostitutes as whoremongers that's gonna be lingering outside the kingdom. Because it says, for without. For without. Let's look at that word without. Exit. What does the word for without mean? Outward. Away. Out of. Look. Outdoors, nigga. That's it. You can't sit there and say the word for without me, son. And nigga, it's talking about outdoors. Outdoors, what doors? Outdoors are the kingdom, nigga. If you outside the kingdoms, you're gonna be surrounded with male prostitutes. You right in Sodom and Gomorrah. These niggas just showed Sodom and Gomorrah and didn't even realize it. Because if the kingdom, if New Jerusalem got male, if New Jerusalem got whoremongers, murderers. These niggas was violent. These niggas got male prostitutes outside the kingdom. And that's what's going on. And then make it worse, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the church. I am the ruler and the offspring of David and bring, nigga, you could keep that. We don't want that. I don't want that kingdom. I don't want to be in the kingdom. We already in the hood. I'm already surrounded with goddamn dogs. It's matter of fact, it was a loose dog running around earlier today. A little brown loose dog running around. I got sorcerers. We got sorcerers out here. You got plenty of females want to be witches and sorcerers now. You got whoremongers. We got female prostitutes. I ain't never seen no male prostitute running around and shit. But your Bible said male prostitutes. So you got male prostitutes outside the kingdom. Yes, we got murderers. I got murderers all around the neighborhood. You know how many niggas died at the corner store right here that I personally knew? Murderers outside my house, outside my kingdom, outside my castle. And then you got adulterers, you got churches all over worshiping Jesus. And whoso loveth the liar make, and whoso loveth and make a liar. It's a whole bunch of people outside, right outside lying. So what I'm showing you is that the new Jerusalem that's coming down from heaven out of God to be established on earth, your surroundings, environment is going to be the goddamn hood. New Jerusalem is parking up in the hood. This is a nigga. You know this guy is a nigga. If he parking up New Jerusalem where dogs is out there, sorcerers and murderers, and you know, Jesus was already around these niggas when he was alive. You know niggas love to say, yeah, Jesus was hanging with the murderers. Jesus was hanging with the prostitutes. And the <laughs> yeah, so when he come back down to New Jerusalem, he going to be right there with the same prostitutes and whoremongers and sorcerers that he was with when he came first. Showing you to show that this is bullshit. Don't be entrapped by this false doctrine. That they've been trying to feed in our throat for the last goddamn thousand years. Or watch me talk about ascension. We up and out off the planet away from goddamn whoremongers and sorcerers and all this crazy shit. We're going to be up in the realm of purity. And with that, man, your boy Silas Shlomo on chime I just want to hop on for a quick second. Chop it up with the brothers and sisters. It's 142 with the AM. I love the late night vibes. You feel me? And we going to sign out, family. We going to run the rhythm from the top. We going to run the rhythm from the top. And we gonna sign it out. Salute. You know what I mean? Salute to the family. Peace and blessings. And we out of here. Bye.